So on behalf of my colleague, Maider Bang, who is Rebecca's thesis chair, who couldn't be here in person, but is supporting us from Zoom land, I would like to read um, Maider's intro for Rebecca. To enter into the poems of Rebecca Phipps is to enter a world where power and agency return to those who have been cast out. It is to be immersed in a world where lost bodies, insects, and the abandoned find home with one another. It is to invite and welcome their grotesque and to reclaim the monstrous as both beautiful and accepted. It is to draw upon themes of horror, the bizarre, and even gore as a means by which to speak about trauma and illness while confronting and resisting social demands. In the book of the grotesque, Rebecca Phipps pushes against societal expectations to reassert what normal means to her. Through poems rich in language and conveyed from her perspective as a queer female, she elevates voices that for far too long have been forced into the fringes of society. In the author's statement within the collection, Rebecca shares, quote, there's something very similar about the outcasted monster and the queer person. When they come out, they both cause fear and panic. Rebecca's poems do the work of drawing an important connection between queerness and outsider, between feeling like an outcast and feeling like a creature. This connection fuels these poems and their speakers to recover a sense of identity and agency as they regain control of the narrative. It's also about queerness and solidarity with anyone who has felt as if they don't belong, about finding common ground with anyone or anything who has been misunderstood or cast away by society. These poems are for them. By having been cast out, the speakers in many of these poems retreat into the margins of society, but part of that retreat is also a reclamation as they find their way back to reasserting their sense of autonomy and right to belong. In the poem Gardener, Rebecca writes, I feel for the lost wilderness between my fingers, searching through the broken trees of wet skin, leaning back against the floral wallpaper, the swaying forest floor, verdant pockmarks, festering bones that welcome the carrion eaters. I feel for the lost wilderness between my fingers. Rebecca shows us there is power in calling upon the grotesque, the horror, the unusual, as a way to push against the complacency and social normativity that often require us to conform. In doing so, these speakers rewrite their stories and their own narratives in their own terms. Congratulations, Rebecca. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Phipps to the stage. Hello, everyone. Before I begin, I would like to give my thanks to the wonderful staff of the College of Arts and Humanities, who along my journey gave me so much advice and wisdom. I would like to give a special thanks to my thesis chairman, my Derve, who worked her hardest to give me advice and encourage me this entire path. I would also like to give thanks to my family and friends for their never ending support of my poetry. It's because of them that I have confidence to write anything at all. It is an honor and privilege to have this chance to read my poems for all of you. With, the, with that, I leave you with this. Every poem of my collection is a dedication to the way I view the world. And within them, I write solely of and about myself. The first poem I wish to start with is a dream. This poem was written in terms of my feelings towards my sexuality and perhaps imagining my own meetings with mysterious strangers in the woods. A dream. A woman without skin holds my hand in a dappled forest of yellows and greens. No blood seeps through her gentle touch. No dirt sticks to her reds and pinks. I thought she would lead me to a winding road, not deeper in the woods. She stops to look at me. A woman without skin kisses me in a darkening forest of grays and blacks. No tack from her 
No tack from her against my lip, no bone residue from pearly whites. I licked against her teeth and gums, past the muscle of her mouth, she stops to look at me. A woman without skin touches me in a quiet forest of nameless humans. No catching of muscles against cold skin, no more whispering colors. I stroke my hand over arched back, calming taunt tendons, she stops to look at me. I woke up naked and alone, my skin beside me shed like a coat. My next poem is I Want to Die by Lightning. I've always been fascinated by lightning, but it is also one of my greatest fears. I want this poem to show my interest and the respect of my fear towards such a tragic end. I want to die by lightning. I taste static as the clouds open, thunder heavy skies. Rain flavoring like the fuzz tingling screen of a rear projection television. Hair strands floating towards the electrical charge, nature's last warning. But I've never been hit by lightning. The bolt traveling through the metal screws of my glasses, bursting arteries and blood vessels in my brain pouring into my skull. Littenberg figures dancing across my skin like bloom spring flowers, but I've never been hit by lightning. I smell flesh burning, sharp like leather tanning over an open flame. The river is under paper thin skin, stilling like a blank Polaroid. Nervous system twitching like anxiety shakes, muscle freed spasms, but I've never been hit by lightning. My next poem, Winter's Wife, I again seek to invoke my feelings towards my sexuality, but I also want to show the complicated feelings I have toward bad relationships. Winter's Wife. She walked me through empty street blanket, snow falling. Dim street lights worshiped a smile too large for her red dress. Red like her hills, red like the blood pumping too fast in my veins. I could have left her empty promise. Her fingers leave bruises on dried, skinned hand. Eyes roll into my empty sockets. Hands slipping into my shirt. Nell's pierced life. Nell's pierced skin seep life's ruin. I woke to blazing hot sunlight and blue warm skies. She pretends I don't exist in the lights of a friend's party. I woke up in summer. She waits for winter. My next poem, Zombifiers, is actually based on a type of parasitic worm. More specifically, the green banded brood sack, dancing in snail eyes. It reminded me of the struggles of my mental illness, being caught by something you can't escape because it's inside of you. Zombifiers. What does the land snail see after parasitic platforms turn them into dancing disco zombies? When their eye stalks are filled with pulsing rhythm, shifting bodies up and down and up. What does the land snail see when bird breaks wing to swoop, pierce, softened body with beak? When their shell splinters into stomach acid and the worms breed into bile, into shit, into stomach. What does the land snail see after death when their dance is done, do they go to heaven? Which heaven? The Christians yell through the TV screen, insects don't have souls. They float in thousand year old amber like unbaptized babies. Floating like me in the thin webbing of atheism and knowing right from wrong. I pity the land snail. My dancing worms died, doused in pills and therapist talk. My next poem is titled Exposure. This poem deals, once again, with my feelings towards my sexuality, but in a sense, how I would completely free myself. Exposure. The void is freckled skin, a dying star's dotted blanket. It tastes like my skin's salt. The sour, sweet tang of disappointment, 
I still feel the weight of her against my side, laying on my bed sheets, her skin exposed to vacuum space, leftover thermal heated pan. She was warm, but my heat was hotter. In my low humming room, boiled saliva escaped water vapor and fluid, conductive solution. I never saw her cry as she lapped dots against my cheek. I burned. Exhale before lungs rupture under rib, shriveled calfaction iron. Her breath was quiet compared to my traumatized lungs. She never choked. Cosmos vomited projection on Saturn's rays. Radiated lampshade. I hate her in the way that only someone who loves her can. Like exposed space. Her dying against my stomach to my freckled skin, cooled by her chilling voice. Now my following poem, Endoscopy, is a special poem to me and references a terrible medical experience I had, an experience that left me terrified of doctors for years. Endoscopy. White walls with blue privacy sheets between the bed, or maybe they were white. Local anesthesia tastes like two needle prick arms, like too many childhood doctor visits. Guiding me away the sterile room of nurses bowing their masks like paper shoe bills. Nameless colored ceiling bulbs so stark they burned like eyes wilting. Supportive mouthpiece forcing lips and teeth open, the plastic on tongue buds. Faces blurring into focus as vomit spews through my lips, my throat digesting itself. I'm begging, please. Oh God, please, I'm begging. It hurts, it hurts. Please, God, it hurts. The doctor said they couldn't stop, down in my stomach, inside of my body deep. Every inch of the tubing pulling out, scratching, scraping, metal tang of taste. Back to the white walls of white blue sheets, I see the nurse talking, moving mask. Mom's orange, mom's pretty orange hair, Tori's laughing. I am trying to hold onto my pieces. Someone asking me what's wrong, shaking my head, a water heavy dog. Sitting in the Durango passenger seat, I open my mouth, no sound, no voice. Choking sobs holding my chest like it's cracked open, spilling bruised guts. I can't breathe again as hands touched me. What happened and who did this? Now this next poem, The Walrus, is oddly enough dedicated to my mother. <laughs> she told me about the suction power of a walrus. Enough, <laughs> enough where they can suck clams right out of their shells. From there, I wrote a poem about the misfortune of the walrus going for more than a clam. The Walrus. Cold welcomes harbored death, disoriented skepticism. Ice floats a skin blued, sticky wet to frozen glass sheet. Looming form, muscled fat crawling into her lap's cradle. Flesh cracked to pour in scarlet, turned to slush under weight. The bull walrus weighs two tons. Wide lips closed over her mouth and eyes, warm darkness. Pursed suction, tongue darting back and forth in succession. Vacuum tight eyes bulging under tight, relentless pressure. Tighter, silent scream as eyes burst out of eye sockets. Meat and tendon, artery and vein pulled through skull. Wrinkled brain melting into panting, wrinkled mouth. The following poem, Disgusting, is in reference to my first kiss. And maybe it will remind some of you of your own unpleasant memories. <laughs> Sometimes the things that unsettled us can bind us together the closest. Disgusting. Your lips were harsh against my own, demanding, suffocating. I thought inexperience would why my stomach rolled and stiffened. I could smell your cologne as our bodies faded, the acid covering my burning teeth as discomforted waves bled through my t-shirt. I could smell iron as you reared back, your slimy tongue slipped out, 
of my mouth, crooked teeth, whispering disappointed clouds, spoken in warm and moist breaths, protected from the world in a moldy old tent. My first kiss highlighted shame in your fangs. Poison words that had pulled me, that touched at my body. I had nothing to hide to a man that was more than my teenage years. You hugged me like you wanted to snap every vertebrae in my spine. To shatter me open like a knife jammed between an oyster shell. I stumbled out of the tent, my anger like hot coals from my foaming mouth. My slack, ugly body groping, dazed for more alcohol. My next poem, I Am Murdered by Mankind, is another nature poem. But this time, Mother Nature is found in myself and the ruin of the world around her. She is changed by the world as I am. I am murdered by mankind. The oozing blister of my earth revealed my cantankerous rupture. The one humanity's children dug into me until my skin cracked open. Fissure in my dust, in my dirt dusted cheek, mottled and carrying raw, slipping into my poison of dirt unmade. The air tastes of smog and bent pieces of metal figures. My lips are frost up, are frost bitten with early frost, made more certain my glass eyes, gray and faded, blinded by the need of the human many. Farmers burned my trees for money crops, starving their poor. Below my broken collarbone, the ice turns to burn scores in wood. Creatures burn to death in my arms for their riches. Magma fissures in each curve, melting fingertips to shiny wet clavicle. Fires rage from cigarettes thrown to mountain mothers. Sunken stomachs, sagging flesh meets boiled lightning bolt stretched. They will eat each other before they feed each other. Billowing smoke recedes hips, oiled joints and gears machine made. Plants wither and abandon my now naked flesh. Soft cushioned fur of grass on each leg, yellowing towards death. My feet are crushed by a fallen tower. Again in my poem, Brain's Creature. Again in my poem, Brain's Creature, I, re I return to the metaphorical of myself and insects. What what if there was something eating at you from the inside and whispering things that you cannot control? Brains creature. Sometimes I imagine a centipede crawling into my ear, eating through dry eardrums through auditory tubing. All right, let me begin that again. Brains creature. Sometimes I imagine a centipede crawling into my ear, eating through dry eardrums through auditory tubing. The, 30, the tapping 30 legs, ch squeezing chewed muscle, it pushes out of my right tear duct over sticky wet eye. Sliding over my cornea, staring into the reflective lens, 200 optical units in the shade pulling black. Sometimes it eats through my eye into my brain, curling into the folding wrinkles of my frontal lobe. It pinches and pulls my careless thoughts rippling water through drool-touched mouth. It wears me like a puppet. It isn't me that forces these thoughts. It's the bug between my eyes. Now, my next poem is actually The Gardener, which you heard a little bit from my introduction by Bryn. So, Gardener is about my complex feelings towards nature. And at times how I feel like everything around me feels wild. My feelings are untamed and yet I'm caught in the wild space alone. Gardener, I feel for the lost wilderness between my fingers, searching through the broken trees of wet skin, leaning back against the floral wallpaper, the swaying forest floor, burnment pockmarks, festering bones that welcome the carrion eaters. I feel for the lost wilderness between my fingers. Vicious hunter, bulging carrying a heavy fang. Legs soften the ground, cries for the thump of hooves. Leaning back against the floral wallpaper. Earth devours liquid rubies into damp soil. 
ferns dipped in rust grow ever higher. I feel for the lost wilderness between my fingers. The weight carrying on my arms, carving out dirt, the smell of gunpowder smoke. I, leaning back against the floral wallpaper, water never washes off the forest sin. My tired body, my dented shovel, flowers growing over miscolored ground. My next poem, Stolen Finger Paint, is in reference to art collected from other countries, and I wonder if it's correct to do so. Appreciating art is something we should all do, but what is the cost of taking it away from its country of origin? Stolen Finger Paint. I look beyond my shoulder at the fingertips of ancestors pressing into my skin, a bone-chilling snap, severing my clavicle from muscle and tendon. White pale flesh painted in red syrupy death. I stare at the eyes of the past, their growing hunger, the promise of ruined red through young veins. Do not look at them with curiosity, but dread mounting the pile of corpses, rot and bloat a sea of grotesque pus and gore. Not an ounce of desire to trust, to trace bloodline, not in the arm of self-doubt, not in the small percentage of difference in genetic coding, of vile assurance. Old paintings bring in such terror, dread, that binds and bondages through directional guilt, does not belong to the youthful hands. Hands still trembling at thriving in old guilt, who succeeds in the face of those, in power, give what should never have been given, taken. How to appreciate when I fear the stain on my shoulder, the cries of artists who never asked for my greedy eyes on their freedom. My last poem, Straight Waste, is based in the pain of living differently and the risk that one takes for being honest to themselves. Straight Waste. She asked me if the U.S. was more accepting of our hands held, brushed. Pulse, 49 dead. All her imagined dreams covered in gangrene, separating bullet holes. Colorado, five dead. I lied, my smile bared teeth. I wasn't scared. I don't think about bullets ripping and tearing, ruined muscle and meat. Cold floors and sleeping in pools of coagulated silence. I don't push my fingers into my skin, leaving bruises I am, as I imagine the sore. The gunpowder tasted air. Turned stomach, the news anchors on natural white teeth. I try not to think about dead lesbians and other flag colors. When will I be the dead lesbian? Thank you so much.